turn now to China, which has been first in as well as, of course, first out of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, it was the only major economy to grow last year, 2020, and alongside the U.S., the IMF expects China to power global growth this year. But with parts of Asia seeing a resurgence in uh, coronavirus cases, the global chip crunch and also the ongoing trade tensions, the path ahead is not a straightforward one for China. We're joined now by a uh, former PBOC uh, advisor, uh, Li Dao Kui, from uh, up in the capital, Beijing. David, great to see and appreciate uh, your time. Uh, we'll get on to uh, uh, what kind of shape China's economy is in right now, but I want to ask you a, a very topical and timely and pointed question, and that is the resurgence, the spike in cases in the southern Chinese province of Guangzhou, and this is the Delta or Indian-originated variant, I understand. How concerning is it for you? Well, Martin, first of all, very happy to be back here with you. Always pleasure, okay? Uh, your question is very pertinent, okay? Guangzhou is now uh, fighting against the resurgence of a new brand of the uh, virus. And overall, I'm not too concerned. Why? Because China has gone through many cycles of this. Just one year ago in Beijing, remember that? We've got uh, a seafood a market uh, or originating uh, a new a new version of pandemic. So this time around, uh, Guangzhou and other parts of China have accumulated a huge amount of experiences in very precisely uh, containing uh, the cases. So overall, I'm not too concerned. Not too concerned. Okay. Now let's get to the macro. That is uh, the Chinese economy. Uh, first in, first out of the coronavirus uh, crisis and recession, uh, it's uh, recovered. It's actually uh, back to growth. But now policymakers are uh, throttling back because they're concerned about uh, debt. Is that the right thing to do, given potentially the risks from uh, Guangzhou, that potentially it could uh, either uh, uh, accelerate or, or spread? Well, overall, I would say that the economy, the Chinese economy is not 100% back to normalcy. I would say 90% back to normalcy, okay? So what are the things driving up the, the Chinese economy? There are two things. Number one is export, because the rest of the world is still suffering from the aftermath of the coronavirus. So China is now relying upon as a source of supply. So export has been surging. Uh, this year and also last year. That's number one. Second area or second engine of coming back all the recovery is uh, is investment, investment in certain infrastructure areas. Okay. Now, what is backing? What is dragging behind is consumption, because many consumers are not able to back to their normal pattern of consumption. For example, travel. Travel is still not 100%, okay? Hotels, not 100%, okay? Restaurants in many parts of China uh, are not back to its normalcy. Many restaurants are still struggling, okay? So again, this background, my view is that the Chinese policymakers should be uh, cautious. However, at the same time, okay, meanwhile, at this, right now, the Chinese monetary policy authorities uh, are very concerned about the, the, the increase of leverage. So they are trying to contain a debt level. To me, uh, I think it's overly uh, aggressive. I think my view is that the Chinese, Chinese policymakers should be uh, should give more time to the economy, let, let the economy go back to the normalcy before uh, putting down, before cracking down okay. the uh, surge of credit. Got it. Okay, so the Chinese economy is not back to 100%. Uh, what it was, say, pre-COVID, it's uh, up to about 90. Now, at the same time, what we've got in the U.S., uh, right, uh, they've recovered. They are actually expanding, and people are now looking ahead to possibly even peak growth uh, in the U.S. Now, we follow you uh, extensively and very closely because you're one of China's uh, leading economists here, and you've been saying recently that one of your worries is that uh, relatively speaking, China at 90 percent, the U.S. at 100 or even more, right, it could lead to a lot of capital flight uh, from China. Are we talking about local funds or are we talking about foreign money? Uh, we're talking about the both, uh, both foreign funds and uh, also domestic money because this is a risk across the whole world. That is, the U.S. economy is recovering relatively quickly so that the U.S. monetary policy will ring in its, uh, its previously loose monetary policy. 
and therefore the rest of the world will face the pressure. Okay, not only foreign money uh, firmly invested in Chinese economy will look back to uh, look at alternatives to in, in going back to the US, but also a lot of Chinese domestic money will be lured away from the Chinese economy. This is not only it is a risk overall for the whole world, it's bigger risk for the economies of India, the economies of Brazil, which, which are still suffering from the coronavirus. So this is something, this is a common risk. This is a risk for the rest of the world. So let's hope that the US policymakers take this into account when they adjust their monetary policy. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's something we're watching very closely as well. I mean, David, uh, for, for, for my point of view, I see sort of three big challenges that uh, the Chinese economy faces uh, right now. One, you've already talked about, uh, which is debt. Uh, two, there's also geopolitics, which could potentially limit uh, uh, exports as a driver of a growth. The third thing, talk to us about this, because this is controversial as well as interesting, that is demographics. China's society is aging. It is graying. Uh, you know, policymakers just uh, uh, started uh, telling folks, look, uh, three or more if you can afford it, but I'm concerned that this may be a little too little uh, too late. What are your thoughts on this and how demographics could uh, uh, hold back uh, growth in China? Well, the demographics definitely is changing, but in my view, um, the major challenge is not in the number per se, it's not in the number of whether two kids or three kids, rather the challenge is how to make better use of existing human resources. Uh, recently, we published a long report. Uh, in the report, we calculated the, 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 hu the total supply of human resources, which is defined as healthy bodies. The number of healthy bodies multiplied by uh, the average skill level of this healthy body, which is proxied by the years of education. So if you take into account the health, the health of the population and the education level, then the Chinese economy will still have a healthy supply of human resources from now to 2050, to the middle of the century. Okay. Well, the challenge is how to better use these healthy and it's still growing human resources. And there, a lot of policy adjustments have to be made. For example, retirement age has to be flexible, has to induce people or incentivize people to work beyond 55 or beyond 60, which are the, now the compulsory retirement age. And also the quality and the year of education should still increase. So overall, I think it's a policy a, a challenge. It's not a challenge of demographics. It's not a challenge of demographics yet. And uh, this is quite interesting. I've been doing some reading. Uh, young folks uh, in China, uh, right? Uh, apparently, there's there's a, uh, a big movement uh, going on. I mean, we talk a lot about, uh, you know, uh, 997, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week, and also uh, 007, midnight uh, to noon, seven days a week. A lot of young kids in, in China are getting pretty fed up with that and the whole rat race and not being able to afford uh, a property. And that's leading to sort of a passive social revolution, which folks in China, I understand, are calling the, uh, the lie flat. Uh, revolution. What do you make of that and how much of a challenge is that to China's growth? Because, you know, kids, young folks, they're, they're the future for any country. Yeah, uh, Martin, you, you're, I'm very surprised that you are very up on the top of news in China. People are talking about this. You are very much, are very much on top. Yes, indeed, young people are talking about why work so hard? Why do we have to fight so hard uh, within our system? Yes, this is a, this is the problem. This is a challenge. That is how to provide, provide proper opportunities and fair opportunities for the young population. Frankly speaking, my generation, my generation born in the 60s, we are very luck, frank, fortunate. We face, uh, we, we were provided with a lot of great opportunities. However, for the people, for the kids born in the 80s, 90s, and also in the new century, we have to think hard. We have to work hard to create better opportunities. We have to tell them that if you work hard, we have to create system to induce them to work hard and therefore to let them to, to show them that if they work hard, they can be they can become Jack Ma. They can be, become a, a bosses of the small tech startup companies. This is a huge challenge. Okay, this is this is the biggest challenge, bigger than the challenge of population and demographics. 
I agree with you. This okay. is a big lot of homework to be done in China. All right. Okay. I mean, to be fair, I'm not sure Jack Ma is, is, is the ideal role model <laughs> these days, considering what's been happening to him. But in any case, listen, David, great to talk to you. Uh, appreciate the time. Thank you so much. Keep safe uh, where you are. Lee Daokui there. Uh, David Lee, former advisor to uh, China's Central Bank, the People's Bank of China, PBOC.